Well, good morning to you all. Uh, if I have not met you, my name is Chris Cobb. I'm the executive pastor here today. And i just like to, before we start, aren't you appreciative that we have someone who leads us in worship every Sunday in a thoughtful sensitive, uh, just a, a wonderfully deep spiritual way, giving us the ability to connect with God. Can we show Chet just an appreciation by, by saying thank you? You're welcome to stand if you'd like to do so. That's, that's fine. You're appreciated, Chet, very much. I don't know if there's a Sunday I come in to church that I'm not challenged in my faith. Um, well, I'd, I'd like to uh, just say also that Kelly and I are, are, are thrilled to be a part of this church. It's a, it's a sensitive, strong, wonderful congregation. And as Chet said, our, our best days are ahead. Well, I'd like to introduce you to someone today who made a huge impact on our family this summer, and his name is, is Catfish. Now, there's probably you'd like to know the story behind uh, Catfish. Well, this last summer our on our family vacation, the Cobb Five and my brother decided to go whitewater rafting. We had never done so before. And so it was all out of Idaho Springs, Colorado. Unbeknownst to us, the lower water level late in last summer <clears throat> made what we thought was an intermediate route, much more of an advanced route because of the technical nature getting in and among the rocks. That's gonna come into uh, importance here in just a second. After getting our wetsuits on and our helmets on, we got out to the, to the place where they were doing some, some training. And I have to add this, that at this point, Kelly, sweet Kelly, had never been whitewater rafting and was a little bit nervous during it, this time. It could be this phrase that was uttered during our, our training. If your boat tips over, swim to the side as quick as you can and try not to hit a rock. When Catfish showed up as our family's guide, I noticed this look in my wife's eye. I've only seen it a couple times in our 30 years of marriage, knowing that there was going to be some sensitive conversations before we got into the boat, which was a non-refundable trip, by the way. <laughs> Kelly came over to me, and as Catfish was, was using his unique and wonderful, creative uh, use of the English language to describe what we were doing. It wasn't necessarily bolstering this idea that this was God's man for us. And Kelly looked at me and said, Chris, God did not send this man to lead us down these rapids. <laughs> we spent a little time listening to him, and, and much to her credit, she, she listened intently to his instructions and thought, okay, we can do this. This, this is the guy. Well, we settled down and decided that he knew what he was talking about. And he said this, the final instructions of Catfish, I, I have to have your commitment, and I quote, that you will do exactly what I say. If you do that, we'll be fine. Well, so not knowing what we did, we pledged our fealty to Catfish, and we got out on, on the river. So off we went, and, and I, I must say that the, the, the Cobb Five and Catfish were running as a fine tuned machine down the river. We were getting these instructions, and Kelly and uh, Lana were in the back, so we were hearing the instructions twice, once from Catfish, and then once, in case we didn't hear it from Kelly, and you can put that next picture up. And so we all knew what we were doing, and at one time, Catfish had us on a rock in the middle of the river as water was rushing around us. Kelly goes, uh, Mr. Cat, did you say Mr. when someone is in charge, but you're really wanting to make a point and be kind of nice? Mr. Catfish, we're on a rock. And he said, ma'am, and you say ma'am when you are in charge, knowing you're going to get a tip maybe later. You got to be a little bit nice, but you're, ma'am, I am exactly where I want us to be. Okay, right at this moment, though. We had front row seats to two other boats in our party that had this perfectly timed collision, and the two boats went like this, dropping every member in the water. Catfish expressed his delight in this in his creative way, saying he'd never seen anything so wonderful. <laughs> well, as soon as everyone got safe and they were back in their boats and we, we, we realized we're still on the rock, he goes, all right, let's go. And so we went down the, the, the river, and, and I'm telling you, had the best time of our life, didn't tip over, and it was just a cherished family 
memory. When we were finished, Kelly ran over to Catfish, hugged him, and said, you were God sent, God sent you to us. <laughs> Catfish didn't know what to say, but I know he's appreciating that. And my kids, I told them I was going to use him in the sermon, and they said, well, we've got to contact him and let him know that he's in a sermon. Uh, th there's something powerful about being with an expert and allowing the expert to lead the way. Where do you go when you need an expert in your life? For your soul, for your heart. When trouble comes, when the troubled waters of the world come and you need somebody to settle you down. Today we're gonna be talking about one of our favorite subjects here, Jesus, who is the expert, the only one who can settle the troubled waters of our soul. Let's pray as we begin. Lord Jesus, we all come in here and there are a thousand and one troubles we're dealing with. And we're asking by the power of your spirit that you would do something deep within us to help us not just make it through, but to be with you as we go through. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Well, have you ever thought when I, when I get fill in the blank, when I get the job, when I get the date, when I get the marriage, when I get the house, life is just gonna be better. It just doesn't work that way, does it? The other day, Kelly was on her way out to school to, school, to work in, early in the morning, and I looked at her, and I said, man, we just have a lot going on, don't we? She literally stopped, turned, laughed, and said, we've been saying that for 30 years. <laughs> Life just is like that, isn't it? We've just got a lot going on. It, it is not God's will that we live our lives in the state of confusion, in the state of anxiety that chaos causes. God made us for more than this. God does not want us to be tossed to and fro by the turmoil of this world. God has a purpose and a plan for each of us, a will to be used by him to do something magnificent that only we can do. And sometimes the chaos tends to try to, to take that away from us or distract us from that. Well, today, I think God is, is going to show us that he's provided us some examples of how we can live in this world with strength, with peace, while we are accomplishing God's will. Sound good to you? Well, if you have your Bibles, you might want to turn to John chapter 14. If you want to live a settled life, if you want to settle this thing right now, to begin to settle the effects that chaos has on you, Jesus has some words for us. If you're ready to fight back and not be pushed around by the chaos of your world, Jesus has some specific words for us today. Now, John chapter 14 is not a, ver a chapter in and of itself. It's part of a context, John 13 through 16, where Jesus has his disciples in an upper room, and he's just dropping wisdom bombs all over them right before he is going to, to be arrested and going to the cross. In fact, in John chapter 13, Jesus washes the disciples' feet, setting himself as this example of, you're here to serve other people. In John chapter 13, Jesus tells, tells them that one of them is going to betray him. Now, I don't know about you, but if you were in the room with the, the Savior of the world, and he says, one of them is going to betray you, what would your response be? Mine would be, which one of you? Turmoil is coming. Jesus then tells this group of followers, people who had left their jobs, their, their homes, their communities, to follow him for a couple of years. He says, where I'm going, you can't come with me. You can't follow me, and I'm not going to be here very much longer. And then Jesus looks at one of his closest friends and says, you're going to deny me three times. The context is set up that chaos is going to ensue and erupt in the disciples' lives in chapter 13. Does it sound familiar? If you're a follower of Jesus, does that sound familiar, the chaos that's coming? Well, in chapter 14, Jesus begins to give them the tools to, to fight back the chaos so they can accomplish God's will. The first tool or instruction is to believe that Jesus is God. Look at John 13 or 14 verses 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Now, he's not saying this in a calm, passive way. This is the imperative tense. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. He's bringing all he has, his strength to this, almost as if Catfish was saying, do exactly what I say. 
Do not let your hearts be troubled. This is the first instruction that Jesus is giving. Now, trouble is, is literally the term. It's something that's causing a riot in your life. Something that throws you into a major chaos or confusion. Three times in John, in this little section of verses 11 through 13, Jesus uses this term to describe what's going on in his life. When his friend Lazarus died, he was troubled in his spirit. When Jesus began to think about what God was calling him to do, his will in, in 12, 27, he was troubled about the cross and what he was going to have to do. When Jesus reflected on the betrayal that he was going to, to, to face, he was troubled in his spirit. Jesus, though, even in the midst of his trouble, had this confidence in the greater power and the greater purpose that God had for him. God knew exactly where he wanted Jesus to be, allowing him to confront each one of these, these situations with this certainty, this belief in God. And that's what Jesus is trying to impart to the disciples. The antidote to our trouble is faith. It's belief in Jesus and belief that Jesus is God. Or maybe we would say it, believe in God through Jesus. To fight back against, against the troubles with faith in God through Jesus. So believe what? Well, specifically here, Jesus is saying that we need to believe that Jesus and God are one. That when we believe in Jesus, who we won't see soon. Isn't that what he's telling the disciples? Believe in Jesus who you won't see soon with the same intensity that you've believe, been believing in God who you've never seen. Jesus and God are one. And we don't just believe in Jesus to feel better. We believe because the very life of God is in Jesus. Let's walk this out in some scriptures. John 1 chapter 4. It says about Jesus, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. John chapter 5, 26, Jesus says, as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. In John 6, Jesus talks about himself as the bread of life. Sounds delicious, doesn't it, in times of chaos? In John eleven twenty five, 25, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. The very life of God is found in the person of Jesus. And that's what Jesus is trying to get across to the disciples. Theologian uh, C.G. Cruz said, therefore, when people come to Jesus, they come to the one in whom the life of the father is found. And in this sense, also Jesus is the way to the father. When we face troubles, it's our responsibility to direct our faith to God through Jesus. There's no other way. To literally say, I trust in, I entrust my life, I believe in you, Lord Jesus, more than I believe in the circumstances that are happening to me right now. Even though I don't see you, I believe in you. And this is the, the start of living a life that believes. See, chaos can quickly move us into something that's called, uh, uh, I have it written in my notes, I just don't want to look. Chaos moves us into this thing that's called a victim mentality, a place where we're uh, kind of battered around by things that are happening to us. But instead, Jesus is saying, have it settled in your mind that you're not going to be battered by chaos you're going to push forward by faith. So I read a book, um, and in it, Max Lucado noted a psycho psychological study of veterans from World War II, actually men who were on the ground. Um, they found that after 60 days of continuous combat, that the troops became what was called emotionally dead because they couldn't determine what was going on. They, they were reacting and responding to bombs and guns and the tension. Yet the scientists found out that, and they were puzzled because they found out that the fighter pilots who had a 50% death rate, which is one of the higher in the military in World War II, they loved their, their jobs. They loved where they were, were placed. 93% of them claimed to be happy where they were assigned. They were puzzled, why is this, what's the difference? Can you guess the difference? 
Those on the ground had absolutely no determination or control in what was going on. The pilots, though, had their hand on the stick. They had some determination or perceived some determination. Even though the death rate was high, that even though we have a little bit of determination in our life, we can experience a calmness. We can experience control. So in this passage, it's as if Jesus is saying to us, you have your hand on the throttle. It's belief. Push it toward God through Jesus. Activate your belief in God. When everything is crumbling around your life, through Jesus, we don't have to be pushed around by chaos. Our hearts don't have to be in constant trouble. The second idea I have here, a thing I, that I see that Jesus is telling his disciples, and I think telling us, is to keep the return of Jesus at the forefront of your mind. Look at verse 2 of John chapter 14. Actually, we read through verse 4. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You're going, you know the way to the place where I'm going. The concern that the disciples had was Jesus was going to leave them and leave them alone and forget about them. But look at what Jesus is saying from these passages. When we arrive in heaven... Jesus will have a place prepared for us, literally with our name on it, made for us. A residence that Jesus has prepared, waiting for us. There's going to be, going to be so many places that we're not going to have to worry about not having a place. In fact, we can invite as many people as we want, and there will always be room. And Jesus will come back and take us to be with him where he is. When we stay linked with Jesus, especially when we can't see him or feel him, even when we don't see him, even in the midst of chaos, we have this promise that we've not been forgotten, that Jesus is exactly where he wants to be, and we are exactly where he wants us to be right now. Now, when I was a kid, I had two brothers, and I can remember my mom saying these words, wait till your father gets home when we were a little bit anxious because we knew when dad got home, if we pushed my mom too much, he would be bringing the right hand of fellowship along with him. <laughs> but I also knew there were times that I would wait for my dad with a football because as soon as he came home, he dropped his briefcase and he played quarterback and let me run routes. I'd also have this peace when he was coming home late because I knew he was coming home. And my mom would say, your father's coming home. Just go to sleep. And I'd be able to. It's the idea I think that Jesus is saying here is he's reminding his disciples of all of these things. He's leaving, but they're not alone. He's going to be returned. He's going to return. They're not without a relationship with, them, with him. And this has the power to prov provide accountability to how we live it also has the power to provide both, both a, a peace and a sense of security. When we develop an eternal vision and keep the return of Jesus at the forefront of our minds, we can begin to live with a peace in, no matter what happens. Later on in this chapter, in John 14, 23, Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Do you sense the whisper of heaven in this part of John 14? This reality that's greater than what we're experiencing here? That in heaven there will be no sickness, there will be no disease, there will be no strife or chaos. It's going to be a place created for us by Jesus. And it's as if Jesus is saying, do what I tell you now, you're going to make it through. It's going to be Okay, keep me in your sights. Which brings me to my last point, which is very, very practical. It's to make a shift from destination discipleship to directional discipleship. This is a very important point. Let's look at John 14, 5. Thomas, who was one of the disciples who walked with Jesus, said, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way. Thomas was, was looking for the destination. 
He was looking for the end result. Jesus, tell me where it is you're going, and then we'll be okay in how to figure out how to get there. But Jesus redirects him. Look at verse 6. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So Jesus describes himself as the way, the truth, and the life. The, the writer Eugene Peterson has wrote a book on the Psalms called A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. I think this is the concept that Jesus is trying to get across here to Thomas and the other disciples. It's this idea that we need to be continually heading in the direction of Jesus. We don't need to know the destination because Jesus is our ultimate destination. Pastor Daniel M. has written about this, and he warns about making our spiritual lives what he calls a destination-based learning system. This destination-based learning system we can all follow into really closely. It means when I get to a place, I'll be mature. When I read through my Bible in a year, I'll be mature. When I finish this Bible study, I'll be mature. When I've been a Christian for X amount of years, I'll, I'll be mature. The danger here is we can do all of those things without a relationship with Jesus. And Pastor M says it's very, uh, in fact, I have a quote up here from him. He says, rather, discipleship seen through a directional lens is about setting our eyes on Christ and continually moving toward him. See, when we, when we see our spiritual lives as a journey, not as a destination, we can fall, get up and look at Jesus and be on the right path. We can stumble to the side, but as long as we keep our eyes on Jesus, we're on the right path. It has nothing to do with quantitative, measurable things other than am I learning to love like Jesus? And anyone can do that from any place. There's an interesting phrase that Jesus used in this passage. Did you get it? If you really know me, what do you think this means? I mean, remember, the, the context is the disciples were going to go through difficult times. Jesus was departing. Could it mean that our relationship with Jesus is the central piece of our existence, of our identity? That my relationship and looking at Jesus and continually walking toward Jesus has the most defining power than any other thing in my life if you really Knew, know me. Being in a relationship with Jesus is the center of our lives. To be nurtured and fed. Every experience we have is filtered through this phrase, if you really know me. I, I have heard it said that we are as close to God as we want to be. And what that means is God's not hiding from us that any of us, anywhere, going through any circumstance, can relate to, can know the way, the truth, and the life through Jesus. Uh, investing in our relationship with Jesus now will pay off when chaos comes. I'd like us to, I'm going to put a Psalm 16, 8, and 9 up on the screen. We're going to read through this and have a little spiritual growth moment here as a congregation. We're going to read it together. And I'm going to ask you simply to look at the, the phrases and see, where is Jesus inviting me to something more, to change my gaze? And then we're going to have about 15 seconds or so of silence. It's going to feel like five minutes. It just does. And then we're going to read it again together. Okay? Deal? Let's read it. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. I'll take a moment, a prayerful moment. Amen. Let's read that again one more time. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad 
and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. The scripture has been given to us, especially the Psalms, as a powerful tool to connect our hearts with God, to look at the reality of what's going on in our life and to give us a connection with Jesus. Today, we talked about living settled when chaos comes by remembering that the life of God is in Jesus, by living in the truth that Jesus is coming again and having that at the forefront of my, our minds, and by thinking about making this shift to be continually walking in the direction of Jesus. I recently heard the story of a, of a young lady. She was in her college ministry. She was leading people to Christ. She seemed to be very mature. She was helping people grow in their faith. She was asked why. And she simply said, I feel God's presence. He's with me, and he's more real to me than another person. A loving mentor said, who knows a little bit about life, what happens when you don't feel God, when you can't sense him? What are you going to do? And she said, without blinking an eye, she said, I don't know if I could follow a God like that. There's a danger for, for when we don't pre-decide to put our faith in Jesus and follow Jesus no matter what, even in the midst of the chaos. We're being called to a deeper faith than this, where we can take our belief in God and walk through the hardest times and have other people ask us, how did you make it through? By the grace of God. I want to ask you to bow your heads for a moment, and it may be that you're in a place in your life where you're a follower of Jesus, but you just needed to hear about redirecting your gaze toward Jesus. Maybe that you're in the midst of, a cha of chaos and you just need to, to say, God, I know this is awful here, but I know heaven's coming, and to redirect your gaze toward heaven. Why don't you do that right now? And it may be that you're here and that you're hearing for the first time that Jesus came, he was God, and he gave his life for us for you. You're hearing this for the first time. God loved you so much that he sent Jesus to come into your world to offer his life for the sacrifice for your sins. I'm not going to ask you to come up to the front, but with every head bowed, if you would like to ask Jesus to be your personal savior, to invite him into your life, would you simply raise your hand and we'll pray a prayer? Just raise your hand where you are. I know there's someone here that wants to hear this and do this. And if you didn't have the courage to raise your hand, you can still pray this prayer and Jesus loves you. You simply pray a prayer offering your life to Jesus and asking him into your heart. Let's do that together. Lord Jesus, I know I've made mistakes. I ask you into my life to forgive my sin, to direct and guide me, to help me through the chaos of this world. Please I welcome you in Jesus' name.